It is the week of November 16th, 2015, and this is the Growing Point Agronomy Podcast. This is the podcast that talks everything agronomy and only agronomy, tackling current topics, management strategies, and answering questions submitted from our listeners. On this week's episode, we are covering post-harvest decision-making. And now your hosts, DuPont Pioneer Field Agronomist Josh Schaffner and Brian Buck. Well, Josh, harvest is pretty much wrapped up here in Minnesota. Uh, We really couldn't ask for a better fall as things went through the fall here. Uh, We're shifting gears now and kind of reflecting on 2015 and what we learned Uh, We've had the chance to get a lot of our plot summaries in and a lot of our data in. There's still some data cards out there, but, you know, looking at what we have in so far, how can we use some of that data to make good decisions moving forward? Well, it's always the the toughest part of really all the data we collect today, whether it be plot data, you know, combine monitor data. We do a lot of, you know, yield monitor only trials, Brian, across southern Minnesota. And, And every fall, it's a challenge of we get all this information, we get it compiled, we start summarizing it. Now that we got all this information, what do we do with it? Right. So, you know, looking first, I think for our topics this week, we're going to talk about hybrid and variety selection, and then also a little bit of, you know, trait selection for pest management. You know, that's part of picking your hybrids nowadays. And also just the return on investment when you start comparing maybe, you know, some of those different options. So uh, first off, getting started, let's talk hybrid and variety selection. What are uh, some key things, Josh, that we talk about? Well, I think everything we do, Brian, especially around our, our growing point agronomy trials, specifically our Our PKP plots, which, you know, uh, product knowledge plots is what we call them. We do a lot of them. And I think anytime you start looking at plot data, whether it's our growing point agronomy trials, you know, county trials, anything we do, um, there's a lot of plots that are done out there, Brian. And, you know, one thing that we stress a lot of, you know, really be selective of what kind of plot data you're looking at. And the one thing that we take a lot of pride in with what you and I do, Brian, is replication in a lot of different scenarios. And I think number one, Anytime, let's just say we're starting to start looking at plot data. Is it one plot? Is it two? Is it three? Is it four? You know, we believe in replication. I think that's the number one thing you look for. You got to find trials that have consistent replication. Yeah, when when you're really looking at yield data, it, it's easy to fall into the gap of you know I was I was in this plot and I've been waiting for the harvest results all year and this hybrid won it, so that's going to be the lead product on my farm. Uh, really, when you think about it. There's quite a few ups and downs. You know, a really good hybrids probably wins 65% of the time. So, you know, making those decisions, you really need to have multiple locations with compared comparisons, we call them, or, or the same products within the field. So, uh, you know, in Southeast Minnesota, I think we have about 60 plots that came in replicated. And when you start looking at that, you know, 60 plots of the same hybrids compared against each other gives you a pretty good data set. And it's easier to make decisions off of than just one or two or three local plots. Yeah, and when you look, you know, you mentioned 60 locations, and with the plots that are around our PKP plots that we do, Brian, you know, each entry is, you know, six to, to 12 plus rows by five, six, seven, eight, nine hundred thousand, fifteen hundred feet. And you look at those 60 trials with the same products in them, same order every time, you know, at five or, you know, four to five acres a plot in size, you know, times 60, you know, we harvested three, four hundred acres, where if you only look at one plot, you're looking at, you know, maybe an entry that was just a, a half acre sample or something smaller. So if you look at the amount of soil types we cover with those plots and the amount of different farming operations and fertility and, and crop rotation, um, I think those plots are probably some of the best you'll find in southern Minnesota, hands down, just because of the pure replication we got. Yeah, and when you look at those numbers, when you have 60 in just southeast Minnesota, you're probably going to have 10 to 15 good ones in your back door. You know, it's okay to look at those and and look at those separately, but look at those, but also look at the big picture. You might have a little bit of geography bias, but in general, usually the best hybrids do flow to the top. Uh, But, you know, you can use a balance of the two to really make your decision. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the biggest thing when when you start looking at plots, and there's times I sit down with growers and they're looking at one plot, you know, the neighbor's plot or or the local county plot. But really, as one of my, my good friend colleagues always tells me, the only thing worse than not having a plot is one plot and that is probably an extremely true statement one that i stand by a lot you know brian we can look at some of our plots 60 locations i can find two locations where a product is first place and that same product is last place in another plot and that's the always the scary thing when you start looking at one or two locations 
you're not really getting a, a good idea of how that product might perform across all of your acres. Yep. You know, and so you're talking hybrid and variety selection. So that yield data piece is one part of it. You know, another big piece of that is the agronomic side of it. So, you know, depending on what your operation and what you're looking for, you know, there might be key agronomics you want to also have on your farm. So that's where, you know, whoever you're working with that's selling you the seed, your local sales rep, that's where they come in. You know, positioning with yield data is important, but also just positioning the right product for the right acre, you know, based on what you need agronomically is also important. Yeah. And, and as a grower, the big thing we want to encourage, you know, you know, a lot of our listeners are growers, Brian. And the thing we want to encourage is, is, you know, certainly ask for yield data. Sometimes, you know, I go to a lot of grower calls and they don't necessarily ask for yield data. They maybe ask, you know, hey, what's working good or, or what's performing well. But um, can't stress enough to to ask for that yield data, and it's something, Ryan, that, that you and I make readily available uh, through DuPont Pioneer, the trials we do, and, and we look at not only iron products, we look at some competitor products in those as well, um, but really look for quality plot data. And certainly, you know, if you're you run in, into one of us, you know, hey, can I get a copy of your PKP book? And, and it's something that we have summarized, ready to go, and um, probably some of the best information out there. So as a grower, ask for that information because uh, it can really help you make decisions on hybrid selections because obviously you want to have the best products for your local geography. Um, sometimes plots are from far away. Ask for what's local and, and that's probably the biggest thing about making decisions for hybrid and variety selection for uh, next year. All right, Josh. So the real key takeaway there is don't get hung up on one or two local plots. We're really looking at multiple locations of the same hybrids within those plots. So 20 plus is when you really have something significant. So Brian, let's transition into trait selection. Kind of goes hand in hand with variety selection today with all the, the technologies that come with it. Brian, this is probably the biggest question and, and probably the biggest thing that some growers are really debating this year is what to do around traits. And specifically, we've talked about the commodity prices. We know that you know there's a big change with corn prices where they are. And obviously seed, you know, being a, a 90 to $125 per acre investment is a big deal. In some cases, you know, we're reevaluating, hey, what traits do I really need for my farm? Do I need, in some cases, can I do conventional? Do I need rootworm? Don't I? Corn borer? A lot of questions there. And I think this is something that we really need to examine closely because obviously this decision can have, you have a huge impact on what can happen on your farm in 2016. Josh, so really looking at traits in southeast Minnesota, the question I get asked the most, and I'm sure you get asked the most also, is, you know, do I need the rootworm trait or am I okay getting by with a double or a pretty or a conventional? So uh, looking at it, you know, I think most often guys are asking that question for corn on bean ground. Uh, one thing that we've seen this year expand from maybe where it was, was the extended diapause. And, you know, extended diapause is where you have rootworm pressure even on soybean stubble. So uh, I'd say a key up if, if you're a producer and looking at your seed order and you're thinking about doubles or conventionals or Roundup Ready, uh, even though you're going to plant those on soybean stubble, you still need to account for uh, an insecticide cost, which is usually around 45 bucks a bag if you're not going to put that rootworm trade out there. So uh, one or the other is going to work. It's just a matter of which one you want to do. But don't think you're going to cheapen up your per acre cost much by going to a double, a conventional, or a roundup ready. Yeah, and I think anytime we talk corn rootworm in, in southern and southeast Minnesota is we have to look back and remember how serious this pest can be. Um, you know, really from 2009 to 2012 was probably the worst pressure we had. Um, again, heavy corn rootworm pressure, if you don't got the right management strategy out there, can can lead to, well, in 2012, we had complete crop failure. You know, we had fields that yielded zero bushel of the acre because the corn rootworm pressure was that severe and the corn rootworm control measure was not anywhere near what it needed to be. So we need to look back at that. And Brian, you know, the extended diapause moved east. You know, we used to say, well, really west of Highway 52 from Rock to the Twin Cities. If you were east of there, you didn't have to worry about it. Uh, you ran into it up in that Hastings, Minnesota area. I ran into it around Chatfield, Minnesota area, areas that we've been running doubles with no insecticide, you know, no traits, corn falling beans for quite a few years. And that's going to, you know, I'm going to say it, that's going to catch some people off guard next year. I know it's going to, uh, but that's why we're talking about things like this. And that corn rootworm thing is so important. Corn on corn, you have to have some control. Granular insecticide um, is a good option. Uh, in moderate pressure, it's probably not going to perform as good as the trait by itself. That's one thing to remember. When we do our corn rootworm trials, if we're not in heavy, heavy pressure, usually the trait actually outperforms the granular by a few bushel. You know, if you look at some more multi-year studies that you and I have done in southeast Minnesota, usually in low to moderate pressure, the trait is actually um, the most economical way to control corn rootworm. Yeah, so the, the trait efficacy is quite a bit higher than a, a pure insecticide. And part of that is, 
you know, the way it controls the rootworm, it's in the roots. It's going to be there through the growing season. You know, granular insecticides, you have to worry about how much moisture you have, how much heat there is, how much digger or degradation was there. So it's just something to keep in mind that they're not foolproof. But I think to really sum it up, corn on corn, a trade is preferred. Um, you know, you can get away with insect, insecticide on a double in really low pressure situations. But if you don't know your pressure, you know, put a trade out there. Corn on beans, one or the other. Either have the trade on them or, you know, have a good insecticide with your double Roundup Ready or conventional. Yeah, and the simple math is when you're looking at the economics of this, remember insecticide, 20 bucks an acre, that's worth about $45 a bag. So when you're buying, looking at comparing seed cost, you know, that rootworm traits, you know, compared to other methods, is about 45 bucks a bag of basically pesticide or pest control that you're buying with that. And that's the simple math as you start penciling that out. Uh, important to compare those numbers to see kind of where your your final costs are landing there. All right, Josh, one other trait we look at, you know, is controlling corn borer. And, you know, that's the above ground control they talk about. You have corn borer protection in doubles and triples. So, you know, corn borer is pretty simple. We don't talk about it much. We've had a great control for, you know, ever since the trade has come out. So uh, one thing to keep in mind, though, just because you haven't seen a problem, if you've been having the trade out there, that's probably why. Uh, you know, if you would take that trade off, there is always the chance still to get corn borer, which is a little tough. You got to go out and scout it. You got to spray it. It's pretty high management to control compared to just keeping that trade on that acre. Yeah. And every year I still get a corn borer call here and there, especially we have a lot of growers, Ryan, that, that, that utilize the conventional system for a, a market that's out there in a premium. Uh, but every year I, you know, I usually see a corn borer get called out to look at corn borer. But again, in most cases, we've had the BT trait gosh, dating back to the 90s already. And, and we forget of what about what corn borer can do to us. And again, as you start looking at your seed decisions and traits, you take that BT trait out of that, you you know, a couple of things, you got to start scouting for corn borer all summer. You can't just assume they're not going to be there. If they are there, you got to look at aerial application. And if you don't do any control methods, you got to be worried about eardrop or maybe you got to be harvesting 26, 7% corn instead of 20% because of eardrop and corn borer pressure. Uh, we got to always look at those risk rewards and and really BT, you know, in my opinion, one of the most successful probably genetic traits we've ever added to corn and one that we've had out for, you know, upwards of 15, 16, 17 years now, dating back to the late 90s when that first got introduced. But a trait that's out there and a pest that we sometimes forget about, but as you make decisions and take traits away, um, don't forget about what corn borer can do to you. Yeah, the key thing there, you can manage around it. But when you really look at simplicity and, you know, how your operation is going to work, the trait does work extremely well. And just be ready for what you're going to have to do management wise if you do go away from it. Yeah. So we've wrapped up on, you know, below ground, above ground traits and, and insect protection. Brian, the last thing, you know, revolves around uh, the Roundup Ready trait and obviously weed control. I mean, obviously we plant a lot of Roundup Ready corn. As growers start looking at reducing seed costs, look at like conventional that creates a whole new management strategy when it comes to weed control, specifically around, you know, being aggressive with pre's and having to use all conventional herbicides, which can, you know, maybe lead to more risk of herbicide damage to corn, but also your timing and the forgiveness of that program is going to be almost zero. And that's something you got to be prepared for when you start taking um, the simplicity of that Roundup Ready trade off the farm. So Josh, one of the, the main things with Roundup Ready corn I look at, you know, they came forward with the trait to help or the gene to help control weeds. So, you know, when you're spraying corn, and I, I think you remember this from, you know, the retail days, it's not hard to control broadleaves in corn. There's a lot of good products out there. And part of that is because corn's the grass itself. So the, the nice thing the gene does is it makes grasses easier to control. Uh, so taking out that trait, you know, you're going to have to maybe look at using some older products like Accent, Steadfast, some of those that were, you know, used in the past that are a little tougher on corn and maybe timing's tougher, a little harder to tank mix with and a lot of those pieces. So, you know, the Roundup Ready trait, it extends your window, you know, you can spray up to 30 inch corn, but it really just helps with those grass flushes if they come and control is a lot better. Yeah. And even though Brian, we're both pretty young, I actually came out of college ahead of the big round of pretty days. And all I can think about is seeing carpets of smooth crabgrass over in Western Wisconsin. And, and, uh, really once that grass was emerged without glyphosate or, or Liberty, you had zero chance of control. And most growers weren't really excited about getting the cultivator out when that was your only chance. And, and those are things you got to think about, you know, if you get some, uh, we do this long enough, you will see weed shift back to some of those tough weeds that we, that we, you know, are really easy to control with glyphosate, but, um, you know, it, it's a change. And obviously the other thing, when you take that trade away, your cost per acre 
is going to rise from a standpoint of herbicide because you're going to have to have a, an extremely aggressive pre-down. You're going to have to have a really solid, you know, post coming back where, you know, the days of spraying your corn for 18 to $22 will be over. You're going to be upwards of, in my opinion, probably in that 30 to $40 range. And if for some reason you get a flush that gets away from you, um, you can be a little bit worse than that. But then you got to also look at, I'm going to have risk of dinging my corn. I'm going to have risk of products that might lead to brittle. I might have issues where weeds get away from me and I'm fighting yield loss as a result if it gets dry. I mean, all those things you got to put into your into your equation as you're looking at, hey, what's the risk reward? How much can I save versus how much can I get a return on investment? And, and really, you know, Brian, for a couple of years, we've really penciled out the conventional versus the roundup or the 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 non-conventional system. And when you compare the notes, if you do a conventional system right, you know, and if you're not getting a premium, your total input per acre is very little to no difference from the, the calculations that we've ran. The key thing there is just be ready for what the growing season is going to bring. So make sure you have a good pre-program planned, you know, know your weed spectrum. What are you going to potentially need for post applications and be ready to scout fields maybe a little bit more than you normally would. Uh, if you do decide to go with the trait, which is most of the corn out there today is, if it's not a specialty market, just remember that Roundup's still not a cure-all. Um, or glyphosate or whatever you're using. And when you really look at it, you need to have good broadleaf herbicides also in with that. And it can make a pretty good tank mix partner and do a good job. Yeah, and when you compare the two, it's all about how much crop protection am I, am I getting out of a bag of fully traded corn versus what am I not getting out of conventional? You know, do all the math, look at all the programs. Hey, both options can work really well. You just got to have your management lined up for each one. And those are the big things we want to consider as you talk about variety, hybrid, and trait selection. Josh, looking into next year, you know, return on investment, I think that discussion is uh, bigger than it's ever been. You know, economics are a little tighter. There's a lot of different options. We talked a little bit around, you know, seed and traits today. Uh, what are some other things and looking forward? What are some things we can't cut out? What are some things we maybe can? Yeah, so you look at return on investment. I mean, if we go down the list, obviously, you know, weed control is one of our biggest return on investments. For a $30 investment, you know, it's probably worth 100, 125 bushel of corn every year. If you don't spray your corn, you usually don't get 100 bushel. So that one, you got to have a solid weed control program in. You know, nitrogen, sulfur, those are things we got to apply annually. It's important to really take a look at, hey, what rates do I need? What do I got for credits via, whether it be soybean, alfalfa, or manure? I mean, we got to have that dialed in. But really, you're not going to be able to make massive cuts of inputs on those two and, and without having a pretty massive yield penalty. You know, P&K, we talked about P&K on a previous show. If you got some farms that got good levels, you can mix and max, move some resources around. I think that's when you got to look at really closely is dive into your P&K. And obviously seed selection, you know, you got to look at what traits do I really need. Um, but you really got to have a good understanding, hey, what has my rootworm pressure been historically? You know, what is my corn bore risk, weed control? Uh, there could be some opportunities there. And then from there, you know, you and I are both big starter fertilizer people. I'm not saying you can't play with rates there, but you know, in this far north with the cool soils we deal with, you got to have that. And then moving down the list, you got to look at you know other things you're doing, whether it be additives or other things, fungicides. Um, you know, big it was a big return on investment year fungicide, and and really what it boils down to, if a thirty dollar investment or twenty dollar is worth a consistent fifty dollar return, you know, we really got to make sure we keep spending those, even though we're trying to to save money on the front side because we know it's getting tight, but we still got to make those investments that do give us a high probability of a solid return on investment. And those are the big things we got to really dive into between now and planting 2016. Yeah. And, you know, when you look at those decisions, you mentioned a good good example of fungicide. You know, that's going to be a decision made in the season, and it's going to come down to a lot of the factors we've talked about in past episodes. So, you know, scouting farms is going to be more important and really uh, utilizing things where you need to. You know, and some farms might be able to get by, like you said, P and K, if you have really good levels, not spreading as much. So it's really going to be a field to field and operation to operation thing, but there's going to be opportunities, but there's going to be a lot of things we can't really cut out either if we want to maintain bushels. Yeah. And that's a big thing we do in the winter, Brian, we'll be hitting the road here shortly, uh, doing our crop shops across Southeast and Southern Minnesota. Uh, I think some of our first ones are coming up in December and, and certainly in, in previous coming episodes, we'll start advertising where we're going to be and when. And a lot of what we're going to talk about is, you know, hey, what management strategy worked really well this year? Let's really start thinking about 2016. And we'll talk about return on investments in a lot more detail. And it, it'll be a good opportunity for growers to come out and uh, for you to come out and see us, ask us individual questions. And uh, it should be a lot of fun. But that's going to be the big, the big topic of, of this winter's crop shop tour. 
Brian, well, with that, that's a wrap for this week's podcast. Uh, this show is recorded from the Agronomy Bunker Studio in Zimbrota, Minnesota. It is produced by Brian Buck and Josh Schaffner. This is a weekly podcast. Thanks for listening, and be sure to tune in next week.